here to see the producer, Scotty Parker. You're looking at him. Hi, I'm here to see the producer, Scotty Parker. You're looking at him. I thought you'd have an assistant greeting me. Yeah. I did. Virtual assistant. Stole my photo, stole my caption, stole my thunder. And she got more likes than you. Then the robots vaporize shit with lasers. One thing, I'll be a little late for work today. Pass. You're right. Should have put your baby commando. What if the baby was a robot? It worked for me. Gang, gang, goo, goo. Gang, gang. Movies can take us anywhere. So can virtual reality. Using the same technologies we used on Avatar, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, and Lord of the Rings. We've created a new film school for a new media. Woohoo, everybody. Welcome to the first virtual film school, IBT College Toronto webinar. This is our webinar series. We are here with the lovely and talented, the amazing Monica RS, uh, former top dog and cat of education for companies like Facebook and mm, Meta. So not a bad place to uh, not a bad place to work in those days and certainly we are lucky and honored to have her so everybody let's have a big round of applause for monica aris <clears throat> monica you can unmute at any time hello everyone very happy to be here and be part of this conversation ah oh, it's so great okay so um monica you are one of the people who is not just a student of education. I believe you told me that your family started Teachers College. Um, that is correct, yes? Correct. Right. <laughs> and then uh, you yourself uh, got an education degree at Harvard, yes? Yep. Okay, and then you uh, were such a heroine that you went to teach math in the South Bronx uh, for, what, eight years? Not the South Bronx. I taught math to middle and high school kids in Boston at the Boston Public Schools. And then I taught astronomy at a planetarium um, in Massachusetts as well, which was a lot of fun. But once I kind of started to try to bring in a lot more technology into my teaching and increase all the ways that we could interact and visualize and get curious, I realized that I needed a, a bigger scale to do it on. And so technology was, again, the answer, which brought me into the tech company. And that's when I first started working at Amazon. Uh, doing kind of interactive labs on a learning platform that they were building. And then over to Meta, where I got into all of the immersive technology um, to really try to bring storytelling and learning to life. Okay, great. So that being said, um, I guess it was me that taught in the South Bronx to little <laughs> kids. Okay, one of us did. Anyway, so uh, that being said, um, uh, you've kind of volunteered to be crazy enough to talk about the future of education, specifically the future of visual education. But what I'd like to do real quick is to get us from the beginning to now. How about that? Is that okay? That sounds perfect. All right, great. So I'm going to share my screen and here we go. All right. So this is the Virtual Film School's quick history of the movies in under 10 minutes. So this is how filmmaking started was 
anarchy. Before the year 1900, it was complete anarchy. Here's a clip of what it looked like. Number one. So this is video made from the original movies way, way, way back in the 1800s, the passage of Venus. This is people just dancing. Even then, dance videos were big. This is people walking out of a factory. In other words, at that time, filmmaking was a mess. It was just nothing, right? People were just setting up a camera anywhere they could find something that looked visually interesting, right? Not unlike what happened at the beginning of YouTube. Then there was the Great Train Robbery. Now, the Great Train Robbery, this is 1903, uh, the Great Train Robbery was the first time that we ever used something called, and I'm gonna mute this. This is the first time that uh, mankind ever used something that they had never done before in film, storytelling. Now that's not special effects. They had to really wait for the train to arrive in the station before they could pull this robbery off, right? They didn't have CGI in those days. They didn't have C. So um, this has in it things like real gunshots. It has intercutting. Uh, that had never happened before. It has something uh, live action scenes and real actors and a real story. This is actually about how a train gets robbed and how here's our hero and all that sort of thing. So that's the first time that story was involved. And check this out. They even had a close up in it right at the end. It was right, right at the very end. So this is the first time that they used a close up where somebody actually walked up to the camera and did that. And from then on, all American films would be about guys holding guns in your face. All right. So um, <laughs> from there on in, Thomas Edison becomes the guy who develops the first motion picture studio, right? And Edison opens up something called the Black Mariah. And they're showing movies on these things called Nickelodeons. They're really cool. This is what a uh, movie theater looked like in those days. Here's Thomas Edison. Here's the film trust. And people would go to Nickelodeons because you would pay a nickel to go see a movie, right? And that was it. So all of a sudden, movies start to become feature films and then feature films become Hollywood. And then all of a sudden, Hollywood is Hollywood, right? So that's that. Now, in 1919, these people who were in the movies were actors. And those people decided to unite. They were artists. And so they formed a studio called United Artists. And anybody recognize this guy? He doesn't have the mustache on right now, but that guy sitting down at the table there. That's, who is that? Anybody? Right, Joseph in Vancouver. That is Charlie Chaplin, right? So it was Charlie Chaplin. It was Douglas Fairbanks. It was um, Mary Pickford. And they formed a studio called United Artists. And that was the first of the major studios. So that's the way film was. It was The Godfather, it was Casablanca, it was all this stuff that was happening, right? Well, fast forward 100 years. Filmmaking is at its peak, right? We've done E.T., all these great, amazing movies have happened. All of a sudden, there's a new way to do filmmaking. There's a new way to tell stories, and that is on YouTube. So YouTube, 100 years later, is exactly the same thing as what filmmaking was. So these are the viral videos from the earlier part of the century. And it was the same thing as 100 years before that. It was a mess. It was just baby videos and cats on pianos and a guy doing this and falling over. It was leave Britney alone. It was all that stuff 
Like, is this real life? The kid at the dentist on the nitrous oxide, right? That's what it was. A mess. Oh, check this out. Just for old time's sake. You got to see this. This is really a thing, okay? But that's what videos were back in those days, okay? Then, again, 100 years later, storytelling comes into the picture. Anybody know what this is? Guys, um, so this is my first video blog. Um, I've been watching. All right. This is Lonely Girl 15. Suddenly, Lonely Girl 15 becomes a big deal. And it's the first time storytelling no, happens. Story this was the show. And this was Jessica Rose talking yeah, about being the star yeah, the of this yeah. thing. Best job ever. So my, my name is there you have it. 16. I'm and all of a sudden, there's studios again. There's guys like Philip DeFranco who are killing it and there's guys like Carl Shea and then there's this guy that becomes the first hundred millionaire on YouTube and that is the story of how we got to where we are today all right so now I'm going to unshare my screen and go back to Monica great I did that in under five minutes I hope you guys are okay with that so <laughs> that being said now let's look at from YouTube and filmmaking and narrative and where we are now, which is pretty awesome, to the future of learning. So Monica, take it from here. And you may want to unmute. All right, we have to say that at least once a day, right? <laughs> anyway, yes, hello exactly. everyone. I am thrilled to be here with you today. And really I want to take from where Frank just left off and talk about the power of immersive technology to really transform, I think at its root, it's storytelling. And then this applies to almost every single industry after that. So I've spent most of my career focused on unlocking curiosity and creativity and connection through technology. And what I'm really after is something that I think is extremely hard to define, but to help you understand it, let me ask, um, what was one of your aha moments? What person or experience or project inspired you enough that it stuck with you until today? And it could have been something you learned or maybe something you watched or even architecture that you visited. But when I asked you that question, why do you think that was the one that that came to mind uh, above all the other memories and the experiences? So some people call it, call it curiosity. Others call it awe. Um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has my favorite definition. He said it's three things. <laughs> It teaches you something new, it makes you smile, and it makes you want to tell somebody else. And so this is what makes TikToks go viral, or movies become box office hits, or a really good teacher becomes someone that you remember forever. And so this emotion has been around since the beginning of humanity. Even Frank's examples, everyone was trying to figure out how to lock that in. It was just often limited by the technology. And now the method in which we deliver it has evolved. And so we've kind of seen this progression where it's the method of delivery that we're, we're really trying to adapt to and find new ways to work with. Um, and I think right now we're on this cusp of a new way of building that blends together the virtual and the physical spaces. And although it feels like this enormous jump um, compared to some of the examples we were looking at, it's actually really just the next natural step in the progression of this technology. And when you think about it, I love that every 10 years or so, we see this kind of change in the dynamics of computing. And so in the 1980s, if you were curious about something, you went to the encyclopedia. You were really lucky if you got one paragraph and even luckier if you got a picture. That was sort of our connection to a lot of historical moments, a lot of the things that we were curious about. Um, and that was enough. I loved looking at the picture of Neil Armstrong standing on the moon. That was my portal into history. And, uh, and I loved it. But then when Web1 came along, that's when we got tethered internet. And so we were stuck to our desks at our house. It was very slow, but we started to get information that we didn't have in our house anymore. And so very much one directional websites, but it made us recognize that there was now new ways to access content that we didn't have. So that was Web1. Web2 is very much what we have right now kind of moving towards the end of our web two days, but suddenly everything became read, write, and create. 
and social media opened up an entire new platform for creators. Uh, people went gangbusters on that, got a whole new way to do short form videos and storytelling. Um, but really it was the mobile phone that I think completely transformed uh, art the way that we consume and created. Suddenly, whenever you were curious about something or no matter where in the world you were and you wanted to connect to information, you could from a device in your pocket. So that really, I think, started to turn the scales. We're about to enter what I'm sure you've all heard, um, you know, metaverse, web three, all these different terms that no one's really landed on. And I think they'll continue to change where we're going to add layers where you can be immersed in the content or where you can bring extra visualizations into you in a 3D format and interact with them. So instead of looking at that picture in the encyclopedia, you can essentially Mary Poppins yourself into that picture like she did in the sidewalk chalk drawing and just say, let's go there and be fully immersed into that particular environment. So there are multiple ways to do this, and they range from inexpensive and simple to super expensive and complicated and multiple modalities from 2D screens to virtual reality headsets. And so for those that aren't fully up to speed on some of the vocabulary, I just want to do a quick rundown. Um, augmented reality just places objects into your physical world through a mobile device. Um, it can be used for like putting furniture in your room from Amazon. Sometimes you see that, try it or try before you buy with glasses or hats. It can also be used to do face filters like I'm sure you've seen on Instagram and TikTok. All of that still through a mobile device. Eventually we'll probably have glasses and contacts and other ways to, to consume it. Virtual reality, you still need a, a headset that completely covers your eyes, blocks out the light, and you're fully immersed in this environment. And so everywhere you look, you see this environment, your brain actually gets tricked into thinking you're there. And um, you develop the empathy and the memory of that spatial experience. And then mixed reality is really just a hybrid of virtual reality and augmented reality. So some of our newer headsets are allowing what's called pass through. And you can then see the room around you, but you can pop in just one virtual object, almost the equivalent of AR, or you can completely close it off and be completely immersed in virtual reality. So that's Mom, kind of me, the, me, the hybrid me, of the two. Yeah. Let me let me just jump in and say that uh, with virtual film school, we actually have uh, all of these because with uh, Eon Reality software, for example, we're able to do mixed reality so you can be in your living room and look at your couch, but then on top of your couch can be a 747 airplane. Uh, with the virtual reality uh, that, that we do in immersed inside, I can show a video later of how we do that when you're actually inside of a film studio, uh, working with other folks in the film studio. So I'll show you that later, but Please keep going. Yeah, I love that. And then the last you know, acronym you've probably heard is XR, which honestly just stands for, I mean, it's extended reality through its words, but really it's just an overarching term that encompasses all forms of virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. And so more and more now as we're becoming up these different lanes, we do eventually think they're all going to you know, kind of mush together, but XR is really that term for any of them in this current state. So as you can see, lots of different options, lots of different delivery methods, and also ways to create. So as you know, for this crowd right here, the future creators uh, of this content, I do want to show you some examples. The most immersive is VR right now. So you can take people up on Mission ISS, somewhere they couldn't otherwise go, and very few people have had that experience, and help them get that same perspective that the astronauts did. Um, it is Monica, how did you do this? How is this, it, how well, is so that, these are yeah a couple of different examples, and, and we'll show you. This was a lot of these were actually scanned uh, through photogrammetry. This is Anne Frank House. If you go there today, it's empty to represent the void left by the Nazis, but we recreated it with their diary to show what it looked like. Um, we've done a lot of training examples with virtual reality because you can get the muscle memory and empathy building is huge. This is one done by Felix and Paul. This one's a 360 experience where um, they again to build empathy put you in the shoes of. Uh, this is called traveling while black, um, so of a black passenger in, in the 60s and what that felt like. So there are different ways in which we created these experiences, um, all the way from photogrammetry, which I'll talk about in a minute, to 360 capture to CGI, which, um, and then sometimes it's a hybrid of multiple ones, <clears throat> depending on what you want to get out of it. Super uh, cool. Yeah, it is super fun. This is uh, at the most basic level, because again, the fully immersive is great. It can cost a lot of money and take time. This is just done through augmented reality. And it's a bit of a lesson on photogrammetry. So if you have your phones, go ahead and scan that QR code. 
And what you'll see happens is uh, it's going to show you a bunch of individual pictures. These were all from the archives in the Smithsonian of the original moon landing. So all the astronauts had cameras strapped to their spacesuits. And they took about 7,000 pictures total. Uh, we worked with a, a developer uh, called Black Dot Films and Meridian Treehouse, and they were able to stitch them all together using both photogrammetry and AI. It's not always a perfect stitch, but it's pretty darn close. And then you can pan around with your phone and you feel like you can really study the surface of that moon. Um, if you flip your camera around, you can take a little selfie in the space helmet. This was one of the original helmets also in the Smithsonian collection that they were able to scan to get that accurate representation. So this photogrammetry is a technique that um, a, lot of, a lot of people use. It's very effective. You can go and with the camera scan, I mean, we've had people scan uh, mountains and national parks uh, all the way up to architecture and, you know, buildings that, that are otherwise hard to get into. Uh, using the photos from the moon landing was a brilliant application of that because we have all those 2D pictures, but to now use this new technology to create an immersive experience is, is amazing. And when you're... Um, you know, trying to preserve objects. For example, we have another example. This is actually the command module from the moon landings as well. This is stored in the basement of the Smithsonian, but it's very fragile. So not a lot of humans are going to be able to touch this or interact with it. So by scanning it, we've now brought it out to um, a much larger group of people who can really interact with it, study it. If you're, again, you can scan this QR code and pop it open in your room, but you can even go out to a parking lot and make it huge. Uh, you're really only limited by um, kind of those experience, the, the space in which you have to play with it. So these are um, ways to preserve some of these artifacts, retell stories, and then have a much more engaging experience. We then took it one step further beyond AR. We ended up um, creating a virtual reality experience with it as well. And in this one combined everything, the archival images, the film, audio, and then a whole lot of human creativity to allow you to actually stand on the moon in the same place that the astronauts did. And you get the same perspective as the earth, moon, and sun as they did. And I think the most mind-blowing part, when you look up, you see the earth and it's half lit up because again, you see where the sun is, you see the earth is half lit up and you see just how small it is. And it really hits you how far away you are. Um, you can't get that from looking at a picture or watching a 2D movie. So it really just VR it's a completely different consumer experience when you get to, to fully be in that. So again, this is photogrammetry. This is kind of a quick visualization of all these different pictures, stitching them together, and you get a pretty solid, uh, clean experience that you can pop in your headset or again, through AR on your phone. Um, so anyone can do this with your own camera, LiDAR behind it in your, in your iPhone right now, and most, most Androids have it too. You can scan objects like a vase, put it on a, a stool, take all the pictures around it, and then use software that stitches it together with photogrammetry or landscapes or whatever it is you want to try. Um, it's, it's a fun way to kind of enter into this space. Once you have a 360 capture, you can do a lot with it too. So if anyone has a 360 camera and doesn't want to have to take all the pictures to stitch them together with photogrammetry, that opens up another way of storytelling as well. So this is just a YouTube video that I found. Um, you know, 360 cameras, it's a lot like working with any other camera. It's um, kind of all already made. Uh, they're not that expensive anymore. You can get the super expensive ones, but if you just want to start playing around with it, you can get them pretty inexpensively now. Hit record and start to capture the scene. And what I love about this is that you can use the mouse to pan around and essentially you can decide if you want a first person point of view or a third person point of view. Um, so it puts the autonomy and control into the, the observer as to how they want to experience it. Now in 2D, it's not that exciting, but if you were in a headset, it would actually evoke all the same emotions of fear and possible anxiety that you would feel if you really were jumping out of a plane and, and parachuting. Um, hey Monica, I can uh, I can jump in uh, and after this show you a 360 video that was done by uh, my students that tells a story. So yeah. when you're ready for that, absolutely. It's be awesome. And when you yeah. think of the future of journalism, even um, you can no longer hide things, right? And so when we normally record film in just regular 2D and it's not 360, you are you very much control where the the you know user is mm -hmm. looking and the story that they're getting. 
journalism in 360 is actually very challenging because you can now, the user can look anywhere they want and they can see what would otherwise be hidden. They can see all these little pockets of things that people might not want to show. And so the story becomes different. And I think it really does make the person who's watching it feel like they're more connected to it. Once you have the 360, one thing that's really fun with augmented reality is you can create what's called AR portals. And so with these portals, um, you can create spaces. So this is someone's garden, but they created an AR portal where you can choose to go to different cities. And so with this portal, you pop into Paris and you just have to walk through it with your phone. So you physically walk forward and then everywhere you look, you're in, it becomes like a mini planetarium. It puts a bubble over you. And then everywhere you look, you're in this 360 video or image uh, that, that you have attached to this AR experience. And then you can still see the portal where you exit. You do have to walk back out. Your brain does connect it. Again, you're still in the real world. You're still looking through a mobile device, but um, it often comes up better in video than it actually does when you're looking through it. But your brain does a pretty good job connecting that experience as you pan around you and look above and start to feel like you're in that experience. So those are really fun. And you know, we've talked to National Geographic about doing with all their beautiful 360 um, places in nature that most people will never get to. So um, uh, just a nice way to kind of incorporate a little bit of immersive experience from that in an easy way. This is one that is, uses CGI um, built on Unity, the game engine Unity. This is Van Gogh's bedroom. And so they recreated it and it's in the middle of a, you know, you just drop it wherever you want. This is in a square, but there's that, that door and you walk through and it's a, a pretty accurate representation of, of his bedroom, which we know what it looks like because he painted it himself. And so again, just another creative idea of helping people um, feel like they can go visit spaces that they wouldn't otherwise get to. So portals are a lot of fun. Um, and when you think of all the things that we can reinvent with this technology, um, I always like to think of the spaces where we could go beyond what currently exists. So like if we could watch a documentary or a movie and then with the phone, pull off certain objects in AR and pop them into your room, you get to keep part of that experience with you, right? Whether it's the dinosaur from the documentary or some cool thing from an ad that you wanna then play with and interact with or some design feature that you wanna to add to your living space, whatever it is, we now have this capability in a lightweight way, take things off a 2D screen and pop them open. And then you get to keep them in your pocket through your phone. Um, so again, like this can turn um, any picture, ad, painting, um, any 2D surface into an immersive experience pretty easily. Oddly enough, though, um, you know, the visual part we always focus on because that's what strikes us and, and is sort of the, the easiest thing to look at. But I think one of the most powerful parts of this technology is its ability to make you feel present with other people. And this is going to completely transform how we interact with each other and possibly films that we're making. So if you haven't gone into sort of these environments, one of them is called Spatial, I'll show you a video in a minute, where you can join together people from all over the world. So in one of our last conferences, we actually recorded it in spatial. So we create, we had a 3D environment. This one was already made, but you can make whichever one you want and pop in there. And uh, Monica, we were from Portugal, Washington, D.C., California. World. How cool is it that we're coming together from all over the world? I love it. That's it's amazing. beautiful in here. And this, this is great. because the camera is actually another human. So the camera was a VR headset and, and the person who was recording us was walking around the environment doing the recording from his point of view. So it's kind of a cool way to think about again, we didn't, there wasn't a camera in this environment. It was another headset doing the recording. So you need to be very careful about where he looked, the height where he was, um, and to keep his head steady so that he could do this. Some of these now are coming up with cameras that you can place and control, which gives you a little bit more flexibility with it. But at the very least, you can have an environment, you can bring people together from all over the world, and you can have someone record it with a camera or with their headset. It felt like we were all together, even though we were nowhere near each other on the planet. And I think there's something really interesting about that. Through these recordings, um, a lot of software also allows you to then have people go back in. So any of you, if this were recorded that way, could go in and you could sit on that log and feel like you were with us in that moment, even though it was recorded back way back when. You could walk through us, we wouldn't see you, but you would see us in 3D with all the same dialogue and interactions. So again, we think of the future of even like museum tours um, or, or lectures that you can kind of go back in. You almost feel like you're spying on a history back in time, <laughs> but you feel like you're living that, um, that spatial experience again. With like being a ghost. 
It is. It's a very strange experience, but again, it just opens your brain up into what does this offer? What does this allow us to do now that we couldn't do before? Um, and I think, again, what's exciting about presence to me is that, um, and I think this is what's exciting a lot of people about this technology is really just that it gives us a new way to uh, interact as humans. I mean, if you think about it thousands of years ago, everything we did was through this first person spatial experience. It was the people that were closest to us in the environment where we could get to um, in a small radius. But then we ended up moving into this rectangular generation. Um, technology got us there and offered a whole bunch of very cool affordances, but we became third person observers of the story at that point. And so we're still third person observers. As we look into our phones, we're kind of floating above it all. This technology through you know virtual reality, mixed reality, it actually is going to allow us to go back into being a first person observer of that story and interact with the space around us, even though now it allows us to come together with people from all over the world in any environment we want. And so I think this will actually get us to a more seamless relationship with the technology rather than a disruptive one. Right now we all have terrible posture. We're constantly looking at our phones. Once we kind of have it through the glasses or anything else, like I think it'll actually allow us to be more present with our environment and with the people. Um, of course, there's still a million surprises left to uncover, right? Um, one of the most interesting very recently was sort of this like explosion of AI onto everybody's screens and into the market. And so um, it's helping us write and create in ways that that none of us ever imagined. I mean, if you have an idea of a story, it can kind of help you get that first draft done. It can help bring in the fantasy, it can help write it in the form of a particular genre, a particular writer that you really like. All of the artwork in this presentation was done through Midjourney, which is uh, you write in a couple of prompts uh, through this AI technology, and it wow. spits out these beautiful images. Again, you have to write the right prompts, and I spent a lot of time refining them to try to get it to create what I had in my head. Sometimes they were a lot worse, and I kind of gave up on that and went down another path, and other times they just really surprised me with something beautiful that I never would have been able to create. So um, again, it's going to change the landscape of those creators, of the artists, of the writers. What does it mean? It doesn't mean it's going to necessarily take over everything and everyone's losing their jobs. It means we have to think about how this allows us to do things differently and to use and work with it. Um, and so I think, you know, opportunity is amazing. And I think it's going to be really exciting to see what starts to happen as we go forward. We're still a little bit in that stage of very early film days where we know how our brains will react to things we already do in life. And we're just replicating those in VR right now. But I think the opportunities are kind of at that intersection of like art and storytelling and connection that have yet to be discovered. So one example I always give is it's like, what if we could go into VR and, and talk to our 90 year old selves and have our 90 year old self give us advice about where we're stuck right now? Or if you have conflict resolution and you could go talk to that person as a five-year-old and remember that we all kind of started out in that same space and everyone's life path took them somewhere else. Um, but again, moving beyond how we know our brains will react into, wait a minute, we can create different environments and how does that unlock different modalities uh, for storytelling, for having our curiosity peaked um, and just a different way of consuming. So I think what's, you know, the opportunity is that we're essentially building something that doesn't have a playbook. And that I think is the most exciting place to be. <laughs> and hopefully we're laying this foundation for generations to come. And of course it takes bravery. It takes trial and error. Not all of it will work exactly how we think right now. We're gonna get surprised along the way and we're gonna pivot and we're gonna kind of redirect. Um, so although most of us can't answer with hundred percent certainty exactly how we're going to get there, I really do believe it's going to be a combination of you know, creators, developers and organizations across the board who are looking to advance um, all of these things moving forward. So I'm very excited. I cannot wait to see where we all take this. Uh, where we're at right now is already thrilling, but there's a long, long way to go. So very excited to be here and to open this up to Q&A because I think, uh, you know, you guys are the ones who are going to be building this future and we're excited to be here with you. Thank you very much, Monica Ares. Hey. <laughs> Round of applause here. And uh, let me just say, Monica, the, 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 the most frequently asked question before the start of the webinar was, how, is, uh, how are these things going to be used in filmmaking in the future? And I think you really answered that very well. 
So some of them. Um, One more example I didn't talk about that was oh, a please. very cool. Yeah. yeah, it was a really cool experience that I saw coming from TAFE, which is uh, a vocational school, the string of vocational schools in Australia. They used an immersive environment to help people figure out lighting for uh, for for plays, and so in in any theater you can then play with the lights in VR, and it ha- you know you could see it in real time without having to climb up and change the lights or do anything, um, you know, physical. And it was a very cool way to set a stage up that uh, I hadn't seen before. So that was that was a fun way to practice before they actually built it correctly. All right. Well, that that is a perfect segue to me showing you how. Uh, we use uh, virtual reality to help plan the shots and create everything uh, through virtual film school. Because here's the thing, when you make a movie, you are thinking about it, creating it, writing a script, casting it, and putting it all together. And then you hope that when you arrive on the set, that it's going to act and look like what you envisioned in your head, right? Right. But we can take that variable out of the equation and let me show you what we do. So this is our students in China. They were tasked with creating the videos to promote the 2020 Olympics. So here they are creating this in virtual reality and then this on the upper left-hand corner is the actual performance of what happened. So you can see on the right-hand side against the black, we built a makeshift slide and then slid the dude down it. And then once we got to the playground, we knew what it was gonna look like because there was the slide and there was the person. So here's somebody that was in Las Vegas. Uh, Here is me in China. And here are the students in China as well, creating this. So you can see uh, against the, you know, the black, there's the table. And it looks a little weird here, but <clears throat> let me show it to you in a different way. So this is what was going on inside the headset. Instead, let me share this video with you. And you now you'll see what it looks like from inside the headset. Now we're inside the headset, right? And so inside the headset, let me blow that up a little bit. So inside the headset, we had, for example, our chief technical officer, Dr. John Holder. We had me, uh, who was pretending to be the host of this. And then this is Robin Pribel. Robin led the visual effects teams for movies like Avatar and Lord of the Rings and two movies with Steven Spielberg. So here she's put up on screen the script of what she's going to be doing. And then she did a little color book. And then she said, this is what I want it to look like. And so we then were able to say, okay, well, we'll bring this all to the Coliseum. But first, let's work it out with the actors. Here's the students observing this. And we said, all right, well, in the Coliseum, the the hero is going to fight a bear. And we realized, you know what? Bears are dangerous, but bears don't eat people. They might maul them, but they don't eat people. I mean, unless it's a cocaine bear. Uh, So then we swept, swapped it out with a tiger. Now, if you were on a film set, could you just go, you know what? Lose the bear. Get me a tiger. That's going to be a very, very expensive decision. And one you would have hoped that you had thought out in advance, right? But instead here, you can do it all right on the set and then you can figure out a close-up and you can do the two shot and so there's what the close-up looks like and and here's the close-up of the tiger and you can see it all and do it all in advance so that when you get to the set and you're on the floor of the coliseum you know lose the bear get the tiger etc etc right so that's a couple of ways that that we have done it in the past And I'll tell you more about what we're doing in the future. But let's get some questions from everybody because this is a webinar and not a lecture. So I'm going to rely on James to send us the questions. Yeah, we're not seeing them. I'm not seeing any questions. 
Another fun thing when you said avatar, I think it was one of the first, maybe it was an avatar, I might have them mixed up, but uh, usually we had to put a lot of sensors on people to track them and then turn them into different forms in movies. So you had like the actors doing the dancing and the moving, and then it was coming up on screen as something else through AR and all of this technology. And now we can do it without sensors at all, which is actually also opening up the door into much easier ways to capture. Yeah, speaking of avatars, uh, here's here's mine. Hmm? So now I'm an avatar, right? It. <laughs> and it's sinking my lips and it's moving my head and all that. So we can now create animation that easily. So I'm going to stick with this guy for a little bit. So here's one of the questions. What techniques and ideas do you think will become part of the mainstream language of experience building as opposed to shiny new experience du jour? Monica? I mean, I think we we covered some of that. I really think uh, starting to use this technology in a way that's a much seamless, a uh, more seamless uh, way to produce, I think is going to be really important. Right now, a lot of the development is pretty hard. And so we're running into a content problem because oftentimes it can take millions of dollars and a long amount of time to bring them to life. As we start to use AI, I just saw a very cool concept um, of you're in the experience and you get to tell it what you want. So I want to be sitting on a beach in the Mediterranean. I want a bowl of grapes. And then suddenly it builds it as you're trying to tell it what it is that you want. It's almost like that Lego movie where, you know, they're building it as they're flying. Um, it, that's ultimately where we want to get to with some of these immersive experiences so that we can create as quickly as people can start to create TikToks today. So we're missing that. It, there's not a lot of content out there. The tools are pretty hard. Learning to build in Unity takes a bit of a learning curve um, or unreal. And so as we start to bring together the tools in which we have to create um, and the mediums in which we consume them, so it is a little bit easier, not everybody has headsets, then I think we'll finally hit that, that corner where we can start to go a little bit more on fast forward. But whereas those are still roadblocks that make it a little awkward. Um, and then as the use cases start to come out, I think we'll start to accelerate the areas where they're really beneficial and where they're not. But I agree, some of that um, kind of bright, shiny object, uh, as you've seen, the hype cycles are real in the last few years we've seen. Everyone go up on, you know, like blockchain and, and Bitcoin, and then it kind of went down. And then now it's sort of leveling out. Everyone up on Metaverse, and then it went down. And now the builders are taking over to really build those solutions. Same thing with AI. It's it's just sort of how, how these things are coming in fast and furious, and we're adapting to them. And I have no doubt we're going to figure out how they all lock together and start to create some very meaningful um, long-term solutions that we can all consume and build with. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Um... One of the uh, one of the questions that I'm seeing here is how is this going to impact story? And I'll pr proceed that by saying that all of these bright shiny objects are novelties. Uh, the way 3D television was a novelty that kind of petered out pretty quickly, right? And unless you have good storytelling, you don't have anything because people will just turn off pretty quickly. So what are the uh, advantages to storytelling that you see? I see a couple of them, but Monica, what do you see first? I mean, again, for me, I've always thought in 3D, I've always been a very visual person. When I was little reading books, I wanted them to jump off the page. Like I wanted them to wow. fill my room. I wanted the overactive imagination I had in my head to be mirrored by what it was I was reading and consuming, right? And so I think we now have that opportunity, whether it's, a 2D film that could come off your screen, whether it's a book that suddenly turns into magic and, and overfills your entire room, whether it's a very short form, bite-sized piece of content that becomes even more powerful with increased visualization. I mean, in the learning space, it's huge. You think of trying to explain to someone why we see phases of the moon, it's very challenging, takes a lot of, a lot of drawings. You put someone into an animation where you can jump between the earth, moon, and sun, and in 30 seconds, you understand why we see phases of the moon. So we have that opportunity across again, the curiosity, the storytelling, the movies, everything that we want people to feel and connect with, uh, we suddenly have a new, a whole new layer uh, of immersion and, and a new medium in which we can use and leverage that we just didn't have, uh, you know, not too long ago. Absolutely. Let me, let me uh, share with you something. So uh, when 360 cameras were first the, the hot new thing, um, our, uh, my students, this was when I was teaching at Chapman University. My students created this 
which was a 360 video of a kid who suddenly touches the antennas and now suddenly he's in the TV show. Okay, right. that's pretty cool. That's exactly right. And here he right. is in The Walking Dead. Now I'm moving my cursor to show all 360 degrees of the film. And here he is pretending that he is in Back to the Future. Now he's in the Back to the Future movie and he touches the remote and there he is with his uh, reporter talking about his crazy little cat, right? And meanwhile, he's able to use the remote to change it from English to Spanish, which fortunately you and I both speak Spanish, so that wasn't too hard. And then here he is on the set of a TV show and he's able to play havoc on this TV show. So this is the up and down, here's the top and watch him run through the set and ruin the TV show. What are you doing? Get out of there. Get this guy off the set, right? <clears throat> he can even put himself into South Park. How cool is that, right? And at the end of the movie, he's able to... Now, suddenly, he's in the show Cops, and he's going to get arrested, and he's in the show Cops. So he's being told, you know, put your hands up and all that, right? And... He runs in and he's trying to get back inside the TV to go back to his other world. So in two minutes, uh, these students uh, from So Crispy Media were able to create sort of a Wizard of Oz, right? Dorothy gets blown into another world and then tries to go back to the other world, right? So that was that was pretty cool. That's a way of using the Wizard of Oz or a story like The Wizard of Oz to tell a story using 360. Yep. And in the future, you might be able to get pick. Do you want to watch this movie as a you know third person, watch the whole movie from outside? Or do you want to be in the movie, right? Do you want to be a character in the movie and the whole thing revolves and is dynamic and interacts with you? So um, I think that's kind of where we're headed. I think your, your students definitely predicted some of the future, uh, you know, things that we might be able to see pretty soon. They're not 100% there yet, but we're getting closer. Well, that was Sam Wickard, uh, to give credit where credit is due, and it was, exactly. it was his idea. All right, we have another question here. How long till AI applications, VR, et cetera, allow for a small to medium budgeted film to allow for multiple real actors or AI created actors, as well as VR sets being around the world simultaneously, then stitching together to create greater creativity, save costs, and allow for more flexibility to both actors and directors? So I'm assuming that is creating an avatar that then through AI can speak and act and interact. Sure. Okay. Are you representing? Go ahead. Are you Assume that. The same yes. Way? Um, yeah. yes, we're already there. In fact, a lot of people are putting presentations together where they're creating a persona using Midjourney. And then uh, they are able to add, uh, you know, a lot of times it's text, which you can get ChatGPT to write that, di that dialogue then it connects to this image and their mouth moves and their facial expressions move and they become that character. So it's not an actor that you have to pay and you've been able to have them follow the script, um, possibly even act and, and interact through AI uh, once we get to that future state. Um, and it, it looks pretty amazing to do that. So I think that we're, we're getting there. Um, yeah, I mean, we're able to, you know, flip back and forth between a, an avatar and a real person right now here just on Zoom, so. Uh, this is a, a real thing and it's happening today. The thing is that um, a lot of this technology is disparate. It's it's here, it's there, it's, um, you know, you're using this, I'm using that. There are groups uh, that are doing this, but the great thing about being part of a school like what we are is that we're able to kind of find the best of technology, find the best users of that technology, and then add story to that, add the ability of storytelling to that, which makes it all interesting. If you don't have storytelling, it's just a gimmick, right? Yeah. And then you've just got, you know, people exiting a factory or, you know, a cat playing the piano and all that. And it's amusing for a few seconds, but after a while you get bored of it, right? But I would encourage you, don't wait until you have a huge budget and all of the highest end equipment. You can do a lot right now with your iPhone and it's pretty darn cool. So I would say, again, if you have a story you want to tell, if you know which technology you want to use, um, start, just kind of dip your toe in there and try either through photogrammetry or scanning or 360. Um, there are lots and lots of tutorials out there if you do want to do CGI and how to use some of those, you know, 
game engines that can help you do some basic physics and animations. Um, and AR is much more lightweight. If you just want to have a, sort of a, a smaller scene that you look at through your phone, um, you can also find some tutorials on how to do some lightweight augmented reality before fully jumping into trying to create, uh, you know, immersive virtual reality scenes. Right, absolutely. We have a um, uh, software that's being used by um, IBT College called Eon Reality. And there you can do just that. You can put yourself into a virtual room, uh, either through your avatar or through your live talking head self. Nice. Yep. But no, it'll all, it'll all converge. It'll all start to get easier. The tools will get better. And I hope that as more content gets developed, we are sharing it, that it's interoperable, that we're making sure that the world can leverage this so that not everyone has to keep recreating the wheel every single time you want to make something. So once more and more people are out there building for this technology and using it, I think we'll see that creation start to expand. Well, that's, that, that's also another good thing about being part of a school, because when you're in a school with other classmates, even if at this very moment, for example, you're in San Francisco, I'm in Los Angeles, James is in Toronto, Canada, right? But yet we can all come together in that virtual space, we can all learn from each other, and it's one plus one plus one equals 10. And because the nature of uh, what we do at virtual film school is altruistic, because we're out to really just improve the conversation in social media video, it is by far the most powerful messaging in the history of the world. Look, for example, at how Greta Thunberg was a little high school girl who didn't want to use plastic straws in her cafeteria and was told, too bad, that's the way we've always done it. That's the way we're always going to do it. And she started making videos to embarrass those people. And boy, did she ever. And now she gets to tell the United Nations what to do with their plastic straws and the environment, right? So we're advancing that cause. So because we are able to do it as a group, it's different than just doing it on your own. It's different than doing it in a vacuum. It's different than um, just, you know, trying something, hoping it works well, putting it up uh, on social media and hoping for the best, right? Because you have live mentors that work with you just the same way we're doing right now. This is live feedback that you're getting. We're able to, um, help you improve the student feedback that you get helps you improve and helps you do better. And then the collaboration with other students uh, and faculty and our mentors and all that is what's going to really make you better than anybody else at this. Absolutely. Community has to be a part of it uh, in every stage, but especially this stage. And even outside of the, the academic walls, there are lots and lots of creator communities and builder communities that you can learn from each other, ask questions, um, get information on grants that might be out there and, and all, all the different avenues that you're going to have to take. But right now, where you're at is the best starting point out there, uh, surrounded by people who are like-minded, just as curious and eager to build. So I think it's a pretty exciting place to be. Yeah. And, and, and you know, grants are certainly a very Canadian way to go about this. <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I've found in, in the classes that we do is that students are willing to share their monetization ideas. Obviously the faculty, it's their job to teach it, but students are willing to share their monetization ideas. So for example, an early student was Nikki Baber, right? Now, Nikki was on a platform called You Now, and You Now, she was like, wow, you know, I'm getting enough money for school lunches and gas money from You Now just by turning on my camera and talking for a while. And then somebody told her about this uh, this social media app called Musical.ly, which was then bought by ByteDance and transformed into something called TikTok. And suddenly, Monica was not making lunch money. She was making, sorry, uh, and Nikki was not making lunch money. She was making real money. And now, and now she lives in an apartment that I mistook for a terminal at the airport. It was that big. Yeah, build it, get it out there. Um, also, there are a lot of small businesses and brands that are eager to get talent to help them because this is such a new space for so many people that um, a lot of the old processes are no longer working for these, these brands. And so they are looking to bring in fresh ideas and fresh creators and developers. So you can definitely start to latch on to some of those opportunities. Oh, hundred percent. One of our, uh, one of our teachers uh, and our chief curriculum writer, Lynn Spire, was one of the early um, 
uh, writers for something called Tongle, and Tongle was crowdsourced advertising. So they would put out to their community of I think 100,000 people, uh, write us an idea for uh, branding Dow Chemicals new product, right? And so Lynn would go in there and write it and come up with it is and, and pretty soon she was literally in their top 10 out of 100,000 people. So that's kind of who our teachers are. Yeah, anyone who can see around the corner or is forward thinking right now has has an awesome runway in front of them. So I think it's definitely this group uh, from what I can tell and a lot of cool opportunities. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I'm going to wrap it up because I see we're out of questions and it is coming up on uh, the six o'clock hour here in Los Angeles. So I am going to thank Monica in a tremendous, intense and, and dear way uh, for sharing your knowledge, your time and your amazing spirit with us. Oh, thank you. I was happy to be here. All right. Great. And this is me. I'm Professor Frank Chindamo. Thank you for being part of this next week. Uh, on a former student, the first of uh, our former students, that is Freddie Wong. Freddie Wong was a student of mine at the University of Southern California. And before there was a YouTube, I was telling my short film students that there's going to be some platform where people are going to be able to share these short videos. So you should make really short videos. And Freddie Wong listened, and pretty soon he had... 2 billion views on YouTube back when being a billionaire on YouTube was unheard of. And from that, he was able to produce a show called, um, uh, he, he formed a production company called Rocket Jump, which then created a show called Video Game High School and a couple of others, Rocket Jump on Hulu. So he has two shows on Netflix, two shows on Hulu, and he is uh, quite the superstar. He's going to talk to us about uh, a feature film that he's about to release and how we got to that. So I hope we see you all next week with uh, our good friend, Freddie Wong. Awesome. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. All right. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Any comments?